Well, over the course of the past couple of Sundays, we have been looking very carefully at some folks who were absolutely 100% committed to finding Jesus. No matter what obstacles, no matter what got in their way, they were committed to finding the Christ child. The first Sunday in January was the fifth day, right? So we celebrated the coming of the wise men. They came, how far? How long did it get that time? Two years from Persia uh, to worship the Christ child, to bring their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, gifts which were befitting the one born king of the Jews, and also the one to bring the light of salvation to the Gentiles as well. And then last Sunday, well, we looked at King Herod. And King Herod wanted to find Jesus in the worst way, didn't he? And for the worst possible reasons, why did King Herod want to find Jesus? He wanted to kill him, right? Because he would heard he'd been born king of the Jews. Who was king of the Jews? He was. And he didn't want anybody. He was a little kid upstart growing up and contending for his throne. And so he was so intent in finding Jesus that he sends his henchmen to Bethlehem with orders to kill all the little boys there around two years old and under, and in that vicinity, because he'd rather kill all of them to be sure he'd gotten the one that he was looking for. But something happened. What happened? He missed Jesus, didn't he? An angel intervened, warned Joseph. Joseph packed up the family, immigrated to Egypt, and the child was saved. Saved the place where we find it in our text today, a text that uh, Ellen referenced in her, her message this morning. Uh, we had a lot of folks there that were committed to finding Jesus. This morning we're looking at a couple of folks who lost Jesus, who, who temporarily misplaced Jesus. Uh, and when they find out that's happened, uh, they have the same kind of reaction you and I have uh, when we're at uh, Walmart or wherever we are. Disney, one time we were at Disney, uh, and I, I, all of a sudden I realized Elizabeth was, was gone. And I said, sweetheart, or Elizabeth! And uh, she said, she's on your shoulder. <laughs> uh, but I didn't know, you know. <laughs> but we're going to find out about Mary and Joseph, who had been entrusted to care for the, the Savior of the world and just lost track of him during the, during the festival. In this uh, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, is where we are. So let's look at the text and see what it has to say to us today. It says, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to custom. Now, now going to the festival was a really big deal. There were like four of those during the course of the year. And Jews from all over would travel to Jerusalem to, to participate in those festivals. Usually, on a normal day, there are about 25,000 folks living in Jerusalem. During festival weeks, 100,000 people often were there in Jerusalem. That gives you the kind of scope of the sort of thing, the kind of event this was, and the kind of energy and the hubbub. This was a great time for reunions, for family and friends who didn't see each other very often to get together again. And Jesus is 12, which means what? He's, a, he's on the cusp of manhood, right? You get your bar mitzvah when you're 13. So he's right there at it, getting ready to take on the responsibilities and the obligations of a Jewish male. We don't know if this may have been the first time he came uh, with them to Passover. He may have been gone, he may have gone every year, but he is there with them to take part in those festivities. Then it says in verse 43, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem that they were unaware of. Uh, Ellen just talked about how happy that be if they'd be unaware uh, that Jesus wasn't with them. Any parents that are lost to in some ways? Uh, how's that happen? How's that, how's that, how's that, well, uh, I thought he was with you, you thought he was with me, right? That kind of thing. Back in those days, this caravan stuff, as they're leaving Jerusalem, the tradition was the women and children would go to the front of the caravan and they would take the lead. Uh, and the men, they bring up the rear. Uh, and Mary, you can imagine, may have thought, well, Jesus is almost a man now, so I imagine he's going to travel with Joseph this year and be back there in the back. And Joseph may have thought, well, he's not yet a man, so I'll bet Jesus up in front of Mom and, and, and all the others, like he always has traveled before, when he's going to things. 
So mom thinks he's with dad, dad thinks he's with mom. But the bottom line is, he's not a letter, right? <laughs> and when they find that out, oh my gosh, there's a big thing. Now, I've always been intrigued where it says the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. Uh, and like Ellen, uh, I've always assumed you know, that Jesus stayed behind and it was a deliberate action on his part, right? A uh, conscious decision he made to remain at the temple and take his place among the learned ones to set things up to make a key point to his parents once they found him, to reveal to them a growing understanding of who his father really was, right? In my father's house, right? The big reveal. It almost, it's always felt like if he ever came close to sin, this was close. Yet, if you look at other translations that verse, they say things like Jesus tarried in Jerusalem. Meaning he was late in leaving. Or they say he lingered in the Holy Spirit. Meaning he stayed longer than intended. Perhaps because he was reluctant to leave. With so many new things to see and do. Whichever it was, if you think about it. What 12 year old boy. Who's 12 years old here? Is 12? Okay, James is 12. Walker's 12. Uh, what 12 year old boy do you know who hasn't been guilty of losing track of time? <laughs> who's been told to be someplace at a certain hour but got distracted by the business in their hands and ended up missing the bus. <coughs> Maybe literally. I think it's a real possibility here that Jesus did not intend to be left in Jerusalem but looked up from whatever he was doing and suddenly realized that he had missed the bus that the caravan had departed without him, and how do you suppose he reacted when he realized that he had been left behind? Maybe he reacted like Kevin McAllister in the movie Home Alone. <laughs> how many watched Home Alone on Christmas? You know that movie? Yeah, when Kevin comes down and opens the door and he thinks he made his family disappear, uh, they've left him and gone on the plane to Paris, what's Kevin's reaction? Whoa! I'm king of the house, and he's running around like a maniac and jumping up and down on dad's mom's bed with the popcorn. <coughs> Gets his dad's after after shaving. Boop, 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 boop. Ah! You know that scene, right? You think that's what Jesus did? I got the whole city by the tail here. My gosh, I'm like a I'm like a, a kite that's been released. I'm like a balloon that's cut that's strained. Why and why and why? And why? Oh, I'm gonna take it. I'm gonna take Jerusalem by storm. Maybe. Or maybe he was scared. Maybe he was hurt that his family hadn't made sure that they didn't leave without him. Here he was. Maybe the first time in a big city. A kid from Podunk, Backwater, Nazareth. <coughs> and he's all alone. He's surrounded by strangers. I mean, where would he stay? Probably didn't have any money with him. How would he buy food? He's not a miracle worker yet. So I can picture Jesus at 12, not yet a man, standing off by himself, lower lip quivering, fighting back tears, because the ones who said they loved him most were long gone, and he didn't know how to find them. He certainly couldn't travel down the road they were on by himself. Oh my gosh, it was too dangerous. There were thieves all over the place. You weren't a caravan. You traveled by yourself. You were toast. And everybody knew it. No. He would just have to wait for them to come and find him. <coughs> How does Jesus feel when people who love him lose sight of him? Happens all the time, doesn't it? Folks put their trust in him, but then over time, turn to other things to count on to get them through. Or we, or we let the circumstances in our lives, our struggles, or our, our pain get so big that it becomes the focus and we take our eyes off Jesus. It's like Peter. Remember Peter? He was walking on water. 
his eyes fixed on Christ, doing the undoable with the other disciples gawking from the boat, pea green with envy. He was doing fine until so the winds kicked up, water got choppy, and in that instant, what did he do? He took his eyes off Jesus. He lost sight of him, focusing instead on his, his uh, faltering footwork. And then he lost his footing, and he found himself sinking like a rock. How'd that make Jesus feel? After he pulled Peter out of the water and got him back to the boat, what was it Jesus asked him? Why did you doubt? That is, why did you question whether or not I would come through for you no matter what the wind was doing? No matter what the waves were up to? Why did you let other things crowd me out? When we lose sight of Jesus and all the tug of war that life can bring, or just in the busyness of life, too busy to pray or, or to read his word or to spend time with other believers in worship, how do you think that makes Jesus feel? I mean, he came and showed us the way to live, and he laid down his life for us to save us from our sins, rose from the dead, Winning the ultimate victory over Satan and his minions? How does Jesus feel? The one who's gone to the mat for us time and time again. When we let the distractions around us like gnats take our eyes off of him. I think it grieves him. Not only because it measures where we are in a committed relationship with him. Or how careless we can be with him like Mary and Joseph were in leaving him behind but also because he knows that when we aren't looking at him, seeking him, then we can easily lose touch with the grace that only he can give and we can give through him. That we can cut ourselves off from the healing and the hope that are found in Christ alone. And what can that lead to? I call it spiritual atrophy. A nagging sense that something isn't right in your life. That there's more confusion or heartache than there used to be. That it's harder for you to discern what is best or right, tougher to forgive and forget because you aren't walking close with the one who has forgiven you everything and continues to forgive all those who call upon his name. When we take our eyes off Jesus, then we become like the churches he wrote the letters to in the book of Revelation, the ones I referenced last Sunday. What had happened to them? They'd forgotten their first love. They drifted away. Their worship was just going through the motions. They were neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. And what was Jesus about to do? Spit them out of his mouth. And that's a sobering thing to think about. What can happen to believers and to churches when they take their eyes off Jesus. So what if that's where you are this morning? You realize that you've driven many miles down the road, but your mind's been many miles away. That you've been a distracted driver when it comes to matters of faith. What do you do? Well, what did Mary and Joseph do? When they slowly but surely realized that in their haste to beat the rush out of Jerusalem, they left behind the Savior of the world. After a frantic search for him among their family and friends in the caravan, they headed back to the Holy City. Now, they were a day out already. But I'm thinking it might not have taken a full day to get back. Because if your parents have washed your kids, how fast do you travel going back? I'm thinking a double time, right? You hook it. You're moving pretty quick. And look what happens when they get back to Jerusalem. Pick it up in verse number 46. After three days, they searched the holy city three days. They found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. 
And then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. First question, why is Jesus in the temple? Why is he there? I'm thinking, after he got his bearings, after he realized he'd been left behind, that he knew in his heart that the safest place to be would be the temple. He would go to God's house. And they're hopefully be taken care of by God's people. And we live with a mystery of just what all transpired there in three days plus that he was with. We know what the text says, right? That he found friends among the teachers of the law who many years later would be his bitterest enemies. We know that Jesus asked them questions, they answered, they were amazed at his perception, his spiritual maturity for one so young, not yet 13. And was it here, during this temple time, that Jesus began to move deeper in his understanding of who he was and whose he was? That perhaps things began to click about what his parents may have told him of angelic visitations, and shepherds, and wise men, and angry king, about prophecies, promises that were fulfilled in him, things Things that helped him realize that this doesn't want, wasn't just his father, it's God's house. It was his father's house in the fullest sense of the word. Whatever happened, Jesus seemed genuinely surprised that his folks were surprised to find him there. They didn't start their search at the temple instead of running over town first. Now, for their part, Mary and Joseph played the parts of the aggrieved parents, right? They look like they're putting the blame on who? No, I, I, they're, they're putting the blame on Jesus. <laughs> why didn't you treat us like this, right? In other words, why didn't you get in the caravan when you were supposed to? We gave you the time. Your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. In other words, they did what guilty parents do. And when he explained that he had to be in his father's house, the text says they didn't understand what he was saying. Even with all the previews of coming attractions they had already seen. Apparently there were limits to what the holy couple could really understand about who he was and what he was called to do. But what did Mary do anyway? She treasured all these things in her heart. Her son, safe and secure from all alone, alarm, at least for the time being, safely back home with them, the good son, who they would keep their eyes on from that day forward, watching as he grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. If you realize that you've not been keeping your eyes on Jesus, that your focus has been on the people in your life, or the 24-hour news cycle, or the shutdown government, or problems at home, or at work, or at school, or even at church, that you've been missing something lately, like his peace and joy, his comfort and power, then maybe the example of Mary and Joseph can inspire us. As soon as you know there's a problem, you got to shift your focus and start to look for Jesus, right? Roll up your sleeves and get to work. And he isn't hard to find. Like he told his parents. He's always right where he's supposed to be. It's like the old saying goes, if you aren't feeling close to Jesus, who moved? Of course, sometimes when we look close to Jesus, we look him in the eye to protect us from strain. He calls us to look at other things in our lives that may be distracting us from him. Maybe stuff that needs to be addressed or fixed or changed. For a guy named Charlie from one of my Indiana churches. This became a pressing matter recently. Charlie was diagnosed with cancer many years ago. A cancer that in recent weeks has run amok to the point where the doctors told him there was nothing else that could be done for him, that the end was drawing near. So hospice was engaged, and Charlie began to prepare to meet his maker. And as he did, a strange thing happened. It's like 
the light of heaven began to shine into his life, and as it did, it revealed some things that Charlie needed to deal with that he had to get resolved before he actually stood in the presence of Christ. Stuff that had robbed him of joy and maybe let him take his eyes off the Savior at times. So he made a bucket list. Mostly of people he needed to connect with before his death who he had some kind of trouble with. A conflict. Folks toward whom he had borne bad feelings. And I know you're not going to believe this in a million years. But I was on Charlie's list. So what happened? Patty and the kids and I are in Kentucky over Christmas vacation. And uh, when we're on vacation, maybe you do this too, we lose small track of time. Uh, it becomes irrelevant. We're up at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock, that's what we're doing. Uh, and sleeping in the mornings. And Patty got a personal message from Charlie's wife, Judy. At 2 o'clock in the morning, New Year's Eve. Can you have Brent call Charlie now? And, uh, well, we were up. So, so I called Charlie. Uh, and he updated me on his journey since I've been with him when he was first diagnosed. And where they were and what they were preparing for. And, and then he brought up why he had called, and here's, here's what, what went on. Uh, Charlie and Judy have a daughter, Samantha, who's about, who's about 15 when this happened. She went to the Christian church camp one summer. Now, we, we encouraged our kids to go to the Baptist camp, uh, but the Christian church camp had air conditioned cabins. Uh, but the Baptist camp, we had to understand if your kid got saved at camp, he did not baptize them at the camp. You sent them home to the home church. And they got to be baptized there with their family and friends. We didn't have that same understanding with the Christian church camp. So they, that Samantha got saved, which was wonderful, and got baptized. When she came back, I celebrated that, but I said, Samantha, we want to get you baptized here uh, so your family and friends can be a part of it and, and we can celebrate together. And other, other folks felt that'd be great too. The only person to feel great about was Samantha. She thought I was saying, your baptism didn't count. What happened there, that didn't matter. Only what happens here. And that's not what I said, but that's what she heard. And that's how she felt. And she got her feelings hurt. And if your kid gets hurt, who else gets hurt? Mom and Dad get hurt. Charlie and Judy were hurt. And we had to work through that, through that situation. Uh, before I left that church, I met with Samantha personally and apologized. I never meant, you know, we pastors who make these great decisions, uh, always in the best interest of our people. Uh, but it doesn't always come across that way. <laughs> I don't know how that happens. People get hurt. Whether it was intended or not, they get hurt. So I apologize to Samantha, and because and, uh, she made this uh, known that as long as I was a pastor there, she would not join the church. That was that was how it was. Can you imagine people feeling like that? Drawing lines in the sand like that? That happened. So I thought, I'll be honest, I came here and we had a lot of peace and joy here. <laughs> These last few years, I... <laughs> I hadn't thought much about conflicts elsewhere. Uh... <laughs> Too busy minding the store. But Charlie said, I'm, I'm working through my bucket list. And I realize that I've carried this grudge against you all these years. You hurt my little girl. Uh, and I have never really gotten over that. But I don't want to stand before Jesus tomorrow or wherever I go and have that stand between us. So we talked together. And I apologized again for what had been a misunderstanding, but didn't make, it didn't change the fact that feelings got hurt. Uh, and I asked for his forgiveness. And he asked for my forgiveness for carrying this on all these years. And we, and we prayed together. And he said, tell folks that you never know how much time you have. So if you're carrying stuff that's weighing you down and maybe taking your eyes off of Jesus, it's not worth it. In the end, it's just not worth it. Life is too short. 
Uh, Charlie, the reason he had to talk to me at 2 o'clock was because his wife said he literally could not go to sleep until we talked, which is why. So after we talked, and I talked to his wife afterwards, she said, well, he's fast asleep. Must have worked. Uh, forgiveness and grace and mercy, um, I think they all So many things can distract us from Jesus, from being like him, from having his peace. How easily we can become like, uh, well, like Martha. On the night Jesus came to join she and her sister Mary and brother Lazarus for dinner. Remember that? Martha's all busy with the cooking and the tablecloth, uh, the candles, and reaching the best china on the top shelf. Mary, on the other hand, plops down on the floor in front of Jesus. And what does she do? She just listens. She just soaks it in. And Martha gets steamed over Mary not helping her, and she complains to Jesus about it. She wants him to tell Mary to get with the program, get in the kitchen! That's not what Jesus did. <coughs> Instead, he said to his brother and sister, Martha, Martha, you're, you're worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from us. If we choose the one thing needed, the thing most important, like Mary did, I think everything else just kind of falls in place, don't you? We get recalibrated as a people and as a church. It protects us from the enemy, it holds us close to God's heart. It can even help us to avoid falling in the same old patterns and in the process, losing sight of Jesus. May God help us to forgive, to be restored, to be made whole, as we keep our eyes fixed on Him, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn softly and tenderly. Jesus is calling. Maybe he's calling you this morning. Maybe he's saying, hey, today's your day. To make that commitment you've been avoiding for years, to commit your life to me, to invite me into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe today's your day to come and make that decision. Maybe it's to unite with the church family and baptize. Or maybe you've got a thing going on in your life right now that just is bugging away at you and eating away at you, or has robbed you of your joy or your peace or your comfort, and you need some folks to stand with you in prayer. And help you journey forward. We don't have deacons here. All we here will be glad to pray with you this morning, even now, as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation. Number 441. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling.